Okay, so hello, hi everyone. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce Matthew Fisher, who will give our final physics program for the academic year. Uh, Matthew got his PhD from UIUC, and since then he's been a researcher at IBM, a professor at UC Santa Barbara, KITP permanent member. He's had brief stints at uh, Microsoft Station Q and, and Viper at Caltech, but nowadays is back at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I view Matthew as among the all-time great quantum matter theorists. He's uh, famous for his um, unrivaled creativity and his ability to uncover exotic quantum phenomena in all sorts of many particle systems, from superconductors, quantum hall states, magnetic materials, and phase transitions, uh, possibly the human brain, which is what he talked about last time uh, he visited a few years ago, uh, quantum circuits, which will be the subject of, of today's talk, and, and much more. Uh, for his uh, many research achievements, he's uh, received uh, prestigious awards, including the uh, Buckley Prize in 2015. He's also a member of the National Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. On a more personal note, Matthew has a, a reputation of, of being an outstanding mentor and something I can attest to firsthand. He was my PhD advisor. Awesome that, 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 to the extent that anything's made me famous, it's having students like Jason. <laughs> so. Yeah, he's very supportive of person. And, uh, no. And you know, the last 20 plus years has been a, a dear friend, not, not just to me, but many of us up here doing quantum science at Caltech. So it's really, really nice to have him back here after uh, a long, uh, long absence. So please join me in warmly welcoming Matthew back to Caltech. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming, Jason. That's, you know, more than generous, but I really appreciate the chance to, uh, to be, to visit and see some old friends and, I meet some new people. Um, and yeah, so I'm a quantum many body theorist. And what I want to tell you about really is my attempts to learn a bit of quantum information theory and seeing if I can uh, contribute in some way, some small way. Um, and so, you know, the grandiose title is quantum many body theory in the quantum information era. Um, but so in, in quantum many body theory, you know, traditionally we're looking at equilibrium phases of matter. Um, um, and, uh, um, you know, quantum matter in solids, usually electrons or, or spins in solids. Uh, but this talk, I really want to, you know, come more from the quantum information perspective and consider open non-equilibrium dynamical quantum phase and phase transitions. And in particular, I want to tell you about something we call an entanglement uh, driven, uh, measurement driven entanglement transition, which I think uh, you might find interesting. Now, let me see why I'm not there. Okay, let me just start by thanking uh, my collaborators. In particular, let me point out Yadong Lee, who's a graduate student at UCSB. He's just finishing up, and he's you know done most of the work that I'll be talking about, and, um, and wouldn't wouldn't be able to do it any of this without him. Um, so quantum matter uh, emergence, you know, traditional quantum condensed matter physics studies very large uh, collections of electrons, atoms, spins, and usually in solids. And emergence is the notion that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And you know, so one has collective phases of matter, crystalline solids, superconductors, you know, fractional quantum hall effects. When one has two-dimensional electrons confined uh, and at low temperatures in a strong magnetic field, and when one has emergent phenomena, one often has the notion of universality. Uh, so the emergent phases have properties that are independent of the microscopic detail. So, for example. Crystalline solids always support quantized phonons, both transverse and longitudinal, uh, independent of what type of atoms, you know, that make up the crystalline solid. Uh, all superconductors, all self-respecting superconductors at least, exhibit the Meissner effects when they're cooled down in a magnetic field, the low magnetic fields at least, they expel the magnetic field once they go into this below the transition temperature. And in the fractional quantum hall effect, the emergent, you know, universal phenomena are the uh, excitations out of the vacuum, out of the ground state, which uh, can carry fractional charge and, and fractional statistics. Um, so in quantum matter theory, you know, typically we would be looking at Hamiltonians. For example, we're interested in um, mod insulators, you know, electronic insulators with spin, electronic spins. Uh, we might be considering, you know, the so-called Heising Hamiltonian, describing a one-dimensional chain of spins interacting. Uh, and we'd be focusing on ground states and thermal equilibrium uh, properties um, and characterizing the quantum phases and phase transitions 
uh, by, um, you know, typically by order parameters or possibly by topology, uh, but looking at something like the magnetization for a, a ferromagnet. But, you know, in, in the last 10 or 15 years, there's um, a new set of experimental platforms, which one, uh, you know, are coming out of the efforts to try to build uh, quantum uh, computers. Um, and, you know, John, uh, coined the NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. Um, but one can view these experimental platforms as a lab to do many body physics on. Um, and that's kind of how uh, I want to be viewing them. Um, and you know, perhaps the best developed of the superconducting qubit arrays like at Google and at IBM. Um, and I gather Amazon is building up an effort uh, here. Uh, the cold atoms, which have been around a, bit, a little bit longer, and optical lattices and trapped ions are, is also pretty well developed. You know, more recently are these optical tweezer systems of Rydberg atoms, where they can control each of the atoms and look, put them precisely where they want to be and change the interactions between them. And it's really quite uh, remarkable, uh, you know, essentially an analog uh, quantum simulator. Um, so these new experimental platforms, you know, give new opportunities for quantum antibody theory. Um, and, you know, rather than dealing with quantum Hamiltonians, one would be working with quantum circuits, at least with digital quantum simulators. Rather than looking at ground states in, in equilibrium, one would be interested in non-equilibrium dynamics and open quantum systems, and in particular, uh, thinking about the role of measurement, which I want to talk quite a bit about. Um, and rather than thinking about order parameters to characterize phases, one would be thinking about more quantum information uh, theoretic uh, notions like quantum entanglement and entanglement uh, entropy. So there's this very nice book uh, um, by Shei Chen, who's, I don't know if she's here, but who's a, uh, one of your colleagues um, and uh, with three other authors uh, called Quantum Information Meets Quantum Matter. Um, and I'll, you know, saying quantum matter meets quantum information, just twist that around. Um, so uh, as I say, quantum matter theory is typically looking at very large systems in the thermodynamic limit, uh, looking at exotic order, topological order, quantum criticality. And traditionally quantum information theory has focused, although not exclusively on, but a fair amount on, on few qubits in open non-equilibrium context, uh, in which measurements are playing an important role. And you know what I my interest is to try to you know be really con, sort of combining these in some sense and looking at quantum phases and phase transitions uh, in non-equilibrium systems uh, driven by measurements for, um, and in you know in particular in systems with many qubits so you know nominally in the thermodynamic limit uh, and the common thread in this whole talk will be entanglement entropy so let me uh, just uh, start with uh, entropy. Um, so uh, thermal entropy, if you just have a, a gas, let's say in a box that uh, in, immersed in a reservoir at temperature Kt, uh, one can you know, study the equilibrium properties by looking at the mixed state density matrix, just E to the minus beta H, which one can write out in an eigenstate uh, basis of the uh, Hamiltonian that describes this uh, quantum system. And from the uh, canonical partition function or the mixed state density matrix, one can uh, compute the entropy of that system, trace of rho log rho, which for a system at finite temperature will have an extensive uh, entropy. It will vary as the volume of the system. So if you make the system twice as big, uh, the entropy uh, doubles. And here the entropy is really from, from state counting. It's basically counting the number of states that are accessible in in a given uh, energy window. But I wanna focus on entanglement entropy, which is somewhat a different quantity, although it has some relations, of course, to entropy. Um, so rather than a, a system in uh, thermal equilibrium, I wanna consider just a quantum system in a box in just a single uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, or at least it's just a single quantum state, but it could well be an eigenstate, let's say. Uh, and consider the pure state density matrix, just the outer product of psi, with itself, um, and then considering a spatial partition into region A and region B, and defining the reduced density matrix rho sub A by tracing out the degrees of freedom in B. And rho sub A contains essentially all of the information that would be available to an observer that's restricted to live in region A, 
um, and would predict results of all the measurements and, and everything else. Um, now, what interested here is, is the entanglement entropy, which is the entanglement between the degrees of freedom in A and in B. Uh, and the entanglement entropy is basically defined then here as the von Neumann entropy taking trace over A of rho A log rho A. And uh, if the A and B are not entangled at all, then when you trace out B, uh, rho sub A stays basically pure and the entanglement entropy is very small. But if they, uh, if when, when the degrees of freedom are strongly entangled, then the entanglement entropy uh, is, is large um, between A and B. So you can look at just many body Hamiltonians and looking at the eigenstates of the many body Hamiltonians, which can be uh, characterized among other ways by looking at the entanglement entropy. Uh, and if you look at ground states of uh, Hamiltonians, which are uh, on, on some lattice Hamiltonian, which are gapped, uh, they always have area law entanglement entropy. Uh, so basically ground states manifest spatial locality because the Hamiltonian is, is itself local and is minimizing local terms, uh, energy local terms. And these, uh, this is called area law entanglement. Basically, you just have a little bit of entanglement uh, between A and B across the cut that separates A from B. But if you take excited eigenstates with a finite energy density, then the, uh, you get a volume law entanglement entropy. So you get a, a lot of entanglement between the degrees of freedom in A and B. So these high energy excited states, which in some sense um, you would think of playing would be classical, they're more quantum mechanics in the, more quantum mechanical in the sense that they're more non-locally spatially entangled. Um, but all the information is sort of mixed around the whole system. And so there isn't much local information left. And just, that's why one has a large entropy or a large uh, entanglement entropy. Um, okay, but so what I wanna do is now come to uh, uh, quantum circuits. And so um, we're gonna be building up, you know, a Hilbert space ba based of just, just spinner halves or two level systems, state zero or one. And one can consider, you know, single unitary gates acting on the a single qubit, uh, uh, you know, shown here with time running from left to right and a qubit coming along with a unitary acting uh, on that. That could be a Pauli operator or it could be like this Hadamard gate. Um, one consider, of course, uh, more qubits, two qubits is the most general two qubit state. Uh, and if you act with a unitary on the incoming two qubit state to give you an outcoming qubit state, one would write, draw that typically as a quantum circuit that looks something like, something like this. Now, I wanna work my way towards open quantum systems, but let me first talk about the dynamics of many qubits in closed systems, dynamics of qubits which are out of equilibrium. Uh, so let me consider here a quantum circuit with L qubits. Now here I'm running time uh, vertically, um, and here at the bottom um, are, the, are the qubits at the initial time. And let's send in an initial state where all of the qubits have their spin up. Uh, that's the zero, 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 zero state. Uh, now these red uh, rectangles are two qubit unitaries. And uh, one can consider a model, for example, where these two qubit unitaries are taken randomly. Um, although this isn't so important, but one could take them randomly. And then one can run this circuit uh, and uh, generate from these two qubit unitaries a big unitary for the whole circuit. And if one runs the circuit, which one can do on a, on a classical computer, if there's not too many qubits, uh, there's also analytic uh, ways to attack this as well by uh, Adam Nahu and co-workers. Uh, you get at some final time at the end of the circuit, uh, an output uh, state. So the qubits are in, a, in an, output, uh, an out, output state. Now, uh, I wanna ask about the entanglement uh, entropy uh, for these qubits in this closed system. So before the qubits evolve through the circuit, the state is in a direct product state, so it's not entangled at all. So the entanglement entropy uh, of the qubits in some su subset of the qubits A uh, with the qubits outside of A, uh, the entanglement entropy in, in, for the incoming state is in fact zero. Um, 
But now let's look at or consider the entanglement entropy of the qubit state uh, coming out at the final time slice uh, by uh, you know, looking at the reduced density matrix and uh, computing the uh, von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix. And what one finds sort of generically, unless the, the, the rather special choices of unitaries otherwise, one would find that the entanglement entropy uh, would be uh, would be a volume law. So LA is the number of qubits in this region A with log two, which is the maximum possible uh, entanglement entropy. Um, and the reason it's maximal is because there are no conservation laws here. Uh, I mean, time is basically discrete in these quantum circuits. So even energy is not conserved. So th and so there's no mo notion of temperature um, because, because energy is not conserved. And so there's just this, this discrete time dynamics with these unitaries. And what happens just intuitively is qubits, which are initially unentangled, are coupled together through unitaries and slowly get entangled together and at long times become maximally entangled. Uh, sort of every qubit is in some sense entangled with another qubit. Um, and the final quantum state is, looks like a, a random quantum state in the Hilbert space. Um, so th this is what we you know, call volume law entanglement growth. Um, and the cl a closed system, again, of qubits evolving with unitary dynamics generally saturates into a maximally entangled volume law state. I mean, there are exceptions to this. Uh, if you take um, something called many-body localization, if you take uh, um, with temporally quenched disorder um, uh, unitaries, one can slow down the growth of the entanglement. But basically, sort of for generic unitary uh, gates, entanglement just spreads without bound. Um, now, high entropy is usually you know, disordered and not that interesting. Um, there's no structure that's left at the end of one of these unitary circuits. So um, it, you, know, you might well ask, well, how can we control the growth of the entanglement in some way to get more interesting uh, structures? And what I want to talk about is controlling the entanglement growth with uh, measurements. Uh, so you know, I'm going to be considering uh, just a, you know, conventional quantum uh, measurements, but I want to introduce the notion of a quantum trajectory. So let's say you just have a single qubit and you measure the, it's in some quantum state and you measure the Z component of the qubit spin uh, with some orthogonal uh, projectors, uh, you get an outcome, which is either zero or one with some uh, probabilities given by, you know, the coefficient squared of the wave function, uh, a squared or probability one is b squared. And after the projective measurement, the wave function collapses, uh, you know, the mixed, uh, the linear superposition becomes either uh, the zero state or the one state. Um, and so here, you know, we have a, what I'm gonna call a monitored system and the single trajectory comes along, a measurement is made, you know, imagine making this in your quantum computer and you either go on this branch or you go on that branch and you stay in a pure state. And so these two um, we're calling a, a called, could be called quantum, quantum trajectories. Now you can also consider a measurement sphere of a density matrices where the density matrices uh, evolve with under a projective measurement as uh, shown here. And an incoming density matrix, pure or mixed, will uh, under a measurement break into uh, two, and so one can still consider these as quantum trajectories. Um, now the monitor, the observer is observing these, uh, the outcome of these measurements and has that information. But if that information is thrown away uh, and the information, of, for example, of that measurement outcome is lost, or it's lost into a dissipative environment, uh, then what we would want to sum over the measurement outcomes and a pure state would become, would become mixed. Uh, and this is a so-called Krauss representation. So, um, so basically, uh, there, I'll talk about it in a second, there are really two types of open quantum systems, systems coupled to it a dissipative bath and what I want to call monitored quantum systems where there is an observer uh, making measurements and keeping track of the measurement outcomes. But before doing that, let me just talk about the effects of measurements on entanglement. Because uh, we've already seen that the unitary gates in this circuit just take, took unentangled qubits and made them more and more entangled. So what about uh, quantum measurements? Well, imagine Alice and Bob, uh, 
sharing a Bell pair, you know, zero, zero plus one, one with a, in a pure state they share. Uh, so if you compute the entanglement entropy between Alice and Bob, it's maximal, it's log two. So uh, high entropy is low information. Basically, Alice and Bob spins are so entangled that they eat Alice, neither Alice nor Bob has essentially any local information about their uh, spin. Together, Alice and Bob have, you know, would have full information about their uh, two qubit state. But now, okay, so they're initially entangled. Now let's say Alice measures the Z component of spin of her spin and find the state zero. Well, uh, then after that measurement, Bob's state uh, for his spin will be in the state zero as well. And so post measurement, post Alice's measurement of her spin, uh, the state uh, collapses into the state zero, zero, which is a, a direct product state. Um, and uh, once it's in this direct product state, there's no entanglement whatsoever between uh, Alice's spin and Bob's spin. So the very act of making a local measurement disentangles the measured degrees of degree of freedom from the degrees of freedom which it was before the measurement entangled with. So measurements disentangle. Unitary gates typically, typically entangle. So we can control entanglement via uh, local uh, measurements. And I mean, I'm just reiterating what I've already said that you know, after making the measurements, uh, local measurements, the entanglement entry between the local degrees of freedom, let's say Alice has, and Bob uh, go down. And this is a, you know, a general inequality, in fact, where this is averaging over the measurement outcomes. So local measurements induce disentanglement. Uh, and now I want to consider systems with uh, like a digital quantum simulator in which local measurements are being uh, made. And once one uh, is making measurements, the system is necessarily open to the environment. I mean, the environment in this case would be the experimental apparatus, the measurement apparatus. So there are really, you know, two classes one could say of open quantum systems. The you know more familiar and and more common uh, class is a system coupled to a bath. You know, so you could have quantum spins in a in a solid which are coupled to the phonon bath. And even if you start an initial quantum state, which is decoupled, an initial pure state density matrix, it rapidly becomes mixed. Uh, the environment in some sense is measuring the system, but the information of the results of those measurements made by the environment is being lost into the environment. So information is just leaking into the environment. Uh, this leads to you know, what's called decoherence. And the mixed state density matrix, at least if it's a Markovian environment, can uh, under some situations be described by the so-called Lindblad equation. Um, so what I wanna focus on are systems which are monitored by an observer. And so uh, here, you, if you start with an initial pure state, the pure state is measured and stays pure. That's, a, that's, a, that's an assumption. Uh, and the observer makes a sequence of measurements and keeps track of those measurement outcomes. And the wave function evolves uh, as a pure state and you evolve along these quantum trajectories. And then the dynam dynamics is described in terms of the, uh, the quantum trajectories and the final wave functions give an ensemble of quantum trajectory uh, wave functions. So these are one could call a monitored uh, open quantum system. And it's in this context where the measurement induced entanglement transition uh, resides that I wanna now uh, talk about. So in order to discuss that, I wanna consider uh, an extended system uh, with both uh, unitary gates and measurements. And so here's um, uh, what do we call it? You know, you could call a hybrid quantum circuit. Uh, we've already seen or argued that unitary evolution induces entanglement growth. Uh, qubit measurements uh, induce disentanglement. And so we want to explore the competition between the, uh, the unitary evolution and the measurements. They're, they're fighting against one another as far as the, the, the enta spatial entanglement growth is concerned. Um, so the canonical hybrid quantum circuit that, that we can explore uh, is, is the one drawn here, which with two qubit unitaries, that's so those are taken randomly. Um, and then uh, single qubit measurements, maybe measuring the Z component of the qubit spin. Um, and the, we're gonna make those measurements with probability P. We're gonna choose to make a measurement um, at each uh, available time step 
on, on, and on each qubit with some probability uh, p. So p runs between zero and one, it's just a single parameter. And so this Hamiltonian, if these are random unitaries, har random unitaries with these randomly located measurements with probability p, there's only one parameter in this model. And so we can ask about the, what's the phase diagram? What is the behavior of this model as we vary this parameter p, which is determines how many measurements we're making essentially. So what is that phase diagram for this hybrid circuit? Um, so, uh, um, so, okay, so we start with an initial state, which is say unentangled. We run the circuit making these uh, measurements. We have quantum trajectories. Uh, we uh, look at the final um, time step or deep in this, through the circuit and, and imagine computing the entanglement entropy uh, in some uh, sub-region A. Uh, and now, okay, so the phase diagram, uh, let's guess, see if we can guess what it is. Well, when P is equal to zero, then um, no measurements are being made. We just have a random unitary circuit. And that random unitary circuit just entangles. The qubits get entangled. Uh, and one has a volume law entanglement, very entangled state. On the other hand, in the limit, opposite limit, where P is equal to one, when every qubit is being measured at every available time step, after me measuring every qubit, uh, the Z component of spin, it's gonna be you know, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. It's a direct product state and there's no entanglement at all. So in this limit where P is one, one has at most an area law or just a little bit of entanglement. Um, now one might guess and that possibly that there's an entanglement transition uh, in, uh, at finite value of, of P. Now this was controversial when, uh, when it was first discussed three or four years ago. Uh, and the reason is that um, if you think about the, uh, the effects of the measurements, they reduce the entanglement naively by an amount which grows with the volume of the region that's being measured because there's making many an extensive number of measurements in that region. Whereas the unitary gates only can increase the entanglement uh, just at the edges of, or the cut. Uh, and so it seems like naively that measurements uh, would always dominate, the, the disentangling effects of measurements would always dominate over the entangling effects of the unitaries. And one would then get a, a, a critical value of this transition you know, at zero, zero measurement probability. But it turns out that that's, that's not, the tr not the case. Um, and we get what's much more interesting, which is a finite value for this um, measurement probability uh, separating a volume law phase from an area law phase. So I want to tell you a little bit about the, the this uh, phase diagram a little bit more in the phases and the phase transitions. Um, and uh, so uh, what my student did initially was numerics on these hybrid Clifford circuits, and you know it just brute force numerics numerical simulations on a classical computer. You maybe do the dynamics with twenty qubits or so. Uh, but he employed this, you know, remarkable technology from quantum information theory, you know, with uh, which is special to what are called Clifford circuits using uh, stabilizers uh, to encode special code word initial states, uh, which one can simulate uh, a set of qubits the dynamics with Clifford unitaries um, and a, a single Pali uh, or Pali string measurements, single Pali measurements, are, are, are okay, um, in times which are polynomial in the number of qubits. And this is the gottesman knill theorem says such one of circuits can be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. And so in practice, you can, you can simulate this circuit with 500 or 1,000 1, qubits. Um, and uh, what happens if you do that is you find this entanglement uh, transition. So, uh, What's plotted here is on a log log plot is the entanglement entropy of a subset of the of, uh, um, qubits in this region A uh, versus L sub A, the number of qubits in that region A. Uh, and up here, the one is not making uh, many measurements and one has volume law high entanglement. Uh, the slope one means is volume law. Uh, as you increase the number of measurements, the measurement rate, you go into this disentangled or area law phase. And then there is a, a phase, seems to be a phase transition right between, uh, between them. And uh, 
So you can, turns out you can try to locate that phase transition a little bit better if you look at something called the mutual information. Uh, if this circle represents the periodic boundary conditions on your system, one dimensional system of qubits, uh, you can look at the mutual information the, between qubits in region A and region B uh, defined uh, uh, here in terms of S A S P plus S B minus S A B. Um, and basically what one finds is that the mutual information uh, is only significant, at least when the system size gets large, when you're right at the transition. Basically in the area law phase, there isn't much uh, long length scale entanglement. There isn't much entanglement. So there isn't much sharing of information. Um, in the volume law phase, uh, the qubits in A are so busy being entangled with all the other qubits, which are, and there's more of those than in region B, that uh, the mutual information actually goes to zero in the thermodynamic limit uh, between A and B. Um, and the peak uh, is right at the, at the phase transition um, and locates where the phase transition is. And one can rescale that data with, with different system sizes and get a, a, a data collapse as one does with you know, finite size scaling. Um, so that locates the uh, transition. Um, and one can then ask, well, what does the entanglement entropy look like? Let me just run out of these. Is no, oh, is it still there? Yeah, I guess it is. Not really? Okay, I'll just. Um, so the black line there is the critical value of the measurement uh, probability. And one can look at that on a, uh, log log plot. And what one finds is that right at the critical point, well, thank you. So this, uh, I guess I just have to use it less often or something. I don't know, <laughs> I'll be on the whole time. Um, um, so, so on a log log plot, the entanglement entropy is linear, a semi-log plot, excuse me, entanglement entropy versus log, it's, it's a linear. So right at the critical point, the entanglement entropy varies as log, log L sub A. Um, and, this is reminiscent of a one plus one dimensional ground state of a conformal field theory. If you took a like a one dimensional the quantumizing model in a transverse field and tuned to the critical point and took the ground state wave function, which is described by a conformal field theory and look at the entanglement aid entropy in some region A, uh, it would vary logarithmically with A with the coefficient of the log being the central charge. Here, this, uh, this log scaling at this, you know, transition uh, suggests maybe there's some underlying conformal symmetry. And uh, in fact, there, there does seem to be. Um, and when there's conformal symmetry at a critical point, uh, then uh, due to uh, properties of conformal maps, basically, uh, one can uh, argue that, uh, for example, the mutual information uh, between some region A and B, where you're varying the sizes and locations of the region A and B, are just is just a function of the cross ratio, which is some particular geometric properties of the of the positions x1, x2, x3, x4. And so, what you can do is you can calculate the uh, at the critical point the entanglement entropy and the mutual information for different system size regions A and B and different sizes of regions A and B, and take all that data and plot it versus the Cross ratio and the data collapses very nicely. So uh, we have, you know, there is undoubtedly a conformal uh, symmetry present at this critical point. Okay, so, um, so so what I've you know told you about so far is then the uh, the transition that there are these two two phases. There's a volume law phase which is very entangled, the area law phase which is unentangled and the critical point where there's logarithmic uh, entanglement. Now it turns out that the area law phase is actually not really that interesting. It's kind of barely entangled. It's like entangled, it's dressed system of an unentangled state. But the volume state, volume of state is actually pretty interesting. Um, and in fact, one can see numerically that the volume law uh, state has a subdominant piece in the entanglement entropy which goes to with a power which is around 0.38 numerically. Um, now one can understand this and understand some aspects of this transition via a beautiful mapping to a statistical mechanics model. So what I'd like to do is tell you about uh, some work, not my work, but of these authors here, 
uh, Egud Altman and co-workers and Andreas Ludwig and Adam Nahum, who looked at, have looked at these random uh, quantum circuits and by assuming hard randomness for these unitaries, um, they can uh, map them to uh, classical statistical mechanical models um, where the space time manifold of the quantum circuit becomes, you know, like two spatial dimensions of some quantum spin model, excuse me, some classical spin model. So it, it, in general, if you're doing this mapping for the entanglement entropy, this is some replicated uh, spin model. If you were looking at the, uh, the purity, for example, this would actually just be an Ising model. But so you can think of this loosely as a, a classical Ising model. And uh, then you can ask, well, okay, what are the two phases in the classical Ising model when you vary the classical uh, temperature? I mean, there's the ordered ferromagnetic phase and the disordered paramagnetic phase. And it turns out those two phases correspond to the volume law phase and the area law phase of this quantum circuit. Um, and the, if the ferromagnetic phase is the volume law phase and the paramagnetic phase is the area law phase. And in fact, uh, in this mapping, the entanglement entropy in the quantum circuit uh, is mapped to the free energy cost for changing the boundary conditions uh, in uh, region A. So if you have your quantum circuit living in some uh, region, uh, space-time region, and you uh, looking at the entanglement entropy on some subset of spins uh, A, then the entanglement entropy uh, in this classical system mechanics model uh, is the same as the free energy uh, cost it would take in order to change the boundary conditions on those spins. So in terms of the Ising model, you can think of it as taking uh, um, an Ising, let's say the ferromagnetic phase and putting a downspin uh, boundary conditions on these uh, spins in this region A and upspin boundary conditions outside this region A. And in the ordered phase of the Ising model, that would introduce a domain wall. And this is really, you can think of this as an entanglement domain wall. And the entanglement, the free energy of that domain wall has an, uh, um, is, is linear in its length uh, with a coefficient, which is the surface tension. So the entanglement entropy is the, uh, uh, the, the so the, the free energy then gives the, the same, you know, volume law behavior in the, in the magnetically ordered state as you have in the quantum uh, circuit. Uh, on the other hand, the area law uh, phase is the paramagnetic phase where the, you can think of this Ising model as, as having uh, a condensate of domain walls. So it doesn't cost uh, a, a growing amount of energy to change the boundary conditions in this region A. The domain walls are proliferated. Um, and you can then look at fluctuations of this entanglement domain wall. Um, and just like, uh, I mean, um, yeah, so, so we can, you know, compute the free energy Taking the log of what I'm calling the um, capillary wave uh, partition function, where you are doing an integral over all complexions of this domain wall with uh, an, an, an energy which is proportional to the length of that domain wall. Uh, and if you, you can do this integral, it's just basically a random walk, uh, and you find that the entanglement uh, picks up a subdominant piece which is logarithmic. Uh, in the system size, in the system region L sub A. Um, but this is actually uh, different than in the uh, Clifford uh, uh, numerics where it's a power law with an exponent around 0.38. Uh, and the reason is that the, this Ising model picture is too simple. What one actually has is a disordered system and, the, um, and so one actually has a random uh, environment. And so, uh, in, indeed, uh, the statistical mechanical model for the entanglement entropy requires, as I mentioned, a, a replica limit. There's a replica index M, which has to be taken to zero. Uh, when M equals one, the spin model is the clean Ising model. And that's the, this capillary wave theory that I was talking about. When M is an integer bigger than one, like two or three, the entanglement domain wall splits into M domain walls uh, with an attractive interaction. So here's M of two, here's M of three. And so the statistical mechanics model in the volume law phase is M domain walls with an attractive interaction in, in some you know, strange replica limit. Now, uh, it turns out that that strange model, this replicated model is identical 
to the model of a directed polymer in a random environment. So basically, uh, if we consider this entanglement domain wall, this interface moving through a random potential, and we add the random potential here, and it's really coming from the locations, the, the random unitaries or the locations of the random measurements or the randomness in the measurement outcomes all give some source of disorder. Um, and if one computes the, uh, the free energy, um, uh, the ensemble average over the disorder, one wants to take the logarithm of the partition function uh, and one can use a replica trick to do that. And uh, what one maps the directed polymer in the random environment to is the free energy of M directed polymers uh, with an attractive interaction in the replica limit. So when the dust settles, the, uh, one has that the entanglement entropy in the volume law uh, phase uh, is you know, equal to the free energy of a directed polymer in the random environment. And, and we've checked this uh, in detail by looking numerically at the uh, direct, uh, both at the directed polymer in the random environment and at the hybrid uh, uh, Clifford uh, uh, circuit. Um, so, uh, so, for example, for the directed polymer in the random environment, the uh, the subdominant free energy corrections uh, vary as uh, the length of the in, uh, polymer to the power of beta, where beta is one third. This is a universal exponent for a directed polymer in the random environment. Uh, there's also a wandering exponent. This it, it wanders more violently because of the random potential. Wanders more violently than a random walk, and so this exponent of zeta is two thirds. So there are these two universal exponents. Uh, and what one can do is one can you know look at a directed polymer in some confined geometry uh, and uh, write down some scaling function. Uh, as a function of both y, the confinement in the in the time direction, if you will, and the distance l sub a using these exponents beta and uh, zeta. And then we can uh, do a Clifford uh, hybrid circuit in a confined geometry. In order to confine this entanglement domain wall, it turns out you want to start with a maximally mixed initial state. Um, so we can then you know, compute uh, the Clifford hybrid circuit uh, uh, you know, fluctuations in the entanglement entropy uh, scaled by in the appropriate way with Y and L sub A, uh, and one gets a nice data collapse. And one can do the exact same thing numerically for the directed polymer in the random environment. And one gets the exact same, you know, scaling function and a data collapse as well. So, um, so basically, you know, there's one description of this volume law entangled phase as as an, given by an entanglement, the free energy of an entanglement domain wall, but that entanglement domain wall is moving through a random environment. Um, but there's another, another way of thinking about this volume law phase as well, which is in some ways more interesting. Um, uh, so if you start, uh, uh, well, it turns out you can think of the volume law phase as an encoder of quantum information. Um, the unitaries basically scramble the interface and hide them uh, from the measurements. Um, so this work by Gons and Hughes who pointed this out. Um, so if we start with a maximally mixed uh, state, you know, so a linear superposition of, well, with the, with the density matrix is the identity. We start with a maximally mixed state, and then we run this uh, quantum circuit. Uh, in the volume law phase, we are pulling out information when we make measurements, and so the the entropy, now this is actually just the entropy, which was very large initially, starts going down. But what one finds is that in the steady state, the entropy doesn't go all the way to zero. There's a finite entropy density in the volume law phase. Uh, and this is, um, um, you know, then the volume law phase could be thought of as the, a mixed phase. And so basically, um, so the measurements, as I say, you know, tend to purify, but the volume law phase uh, stays mixed and there is a, um, a, a subspace of the Hilbert space, which is time dependent, uh, which is in, encoded, which in, carries information about the, from the initial state in a way which is impervious to uh, future measurements. And so it survives into the steady state. And if this is looked at for a, a stabilizer uh, system, this really does generate what's called an LKT 
uh, stabilize a quantum error correcting code, um, or at least an, a quantum, an, an encoder. And so here L is the number of qubits, K is the no, uh, number of physical qubits, K is the number of logical qubits, and that's given by the entropy density, uh, the number of, you know, the size of the part of the Hilbert space that can just, you know, pass through the circuit without being as me measured, basically. Um, and, uh, and D is the code distance, it's the shortest uh, logical operator. Um, and it turns out D is given by L to the beta, where beta is this directed poem in the random environment exponent. So one can argue that. Now, this is not a useful quantum error correcting code. The decoding would be very challenging, um, but it's, uh, it's one way to think about the, but the, the difference in the volume law phase and the area law phase is that the volume law phase can encode information um, whereas the area law phase is just simply too many measurements and that information is, 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 is pulled out of the system by the measurements basically. Um, so these monitored quantum circuits are, you know, just the one I've been considering with, with you know, random unitaries and random measurement locations is just one example of many that you can consider. Uh, you can take, for example, uh, work that as done by Ali Labasani with Mason Parkeshley, uh, where you can measure, for example, qubits in two dimensions and measure the toric code stabilizers with some probability and measure single qubit with the Z component of the qubit spin, let's say, with some probability. And as you vary those probabilities around, uh, you, you can drive a transition from a, a random topological phase uh, to a, a phase with, with, which is trivial, with no topological order. Um, now, you can look at more complicated measurement only models. Uh, um, and if you take multi qubit uh, measurements, uh, which don't commute with one another, you can actually generate entanglement just from the measurements only. Um, you can also look at other symmetry protected topological phases, uh, which you can generate in these monitored uh, circuits. Uh, and then there's, you can start adding uh, symmetries, um, for example, you can consider a U1 symmetry, a conserved number of, you know, uh, particles, if you will. Um, and there, there's evidence for the, um, the volume law entangle phase to have, uh, to break up into two phases, uh, one which is called charge fuzzy and one which is called charge sharp. Uh, the charge sharp phase is if you start with a, a quantum state which is in a linear superposition of different charge sectors, the measurements rapidly charge purify into one charge sector. Whereas in the charge fuzzy phase, there's few, there's infrequent measurements and it, and it charge sharpens more slowly. Um, so, but th there's a lot that's actually not understood about this U1 symmetric uh, um, hybrid circuit that I think it needs, needs studying. Um, okay, so, uh, let me start wrapping up and, uh, um, you know, this is maybe fun and games, but, uh, you know, I'm still trying to be a, you know, down to earth physicist and have some experimental access. Uh, and there's a challenge here for these monitored circuits, which is kind of intrinsic to the uncertainty in the measurement outcomes in quantum mechanics. You know, so basically, you know, these quantum trajectories, these psi ones to psi fives, the, it's the nature and the entanglement properties of those wave functions, which is what encodes all this information about the, the phase transition, the volume law entanglement, the error law entanglement, and, and you know, the critical point and so forth. So, but, but now if one averages it over the quantum trajectories and gives a mixed state, you know, defines a mixed state density matrix, it's out of product of psi, psi with PI is a probability of finding that a trajectory, uh, this mixed state density matrix washes out <clears throat> all the effects of the monitored uh, entanglement transition, the measurement induced entanglement transition is just completely gone. Um, so basically, uh, in order to <clears throat> see this physics, one has to, um, you know, um, basically, in somehow, uh, for example, make multiple copies of the same pure state. Um, you know, if I give you, um, you know, a quantum state, which is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, and say, you know, measure the position of the particle, and you, you measure it and you find the particle in some position, but if I only gave you one copy of the state, it wouldn't be very useful. You wouldn't be able to get much information. So you need to give you an ensemble of identical quantum states, you know, that you can make 
sub subsequent measurements on and look at abs properties. And so really for this, one would ideally like to have multiple copies of each of these quantum trajectories, but there's a lot of these quantum trajectories. And the problem is if you run an identical uh, quantum circuit uh, on, let's say on a quantum computer, you, the first time you'll, you'll end up in psi two, uh, and then you'll, the next time you'll maybe end up in psi four, right? So you, you need to, uh, it, it, we need some sort of post-selection uh, selecting for uh, the same uh, outcomes of the final um, of the final uh, uh, into these final trajectories. Now, uh, so overcoming this post-selection channel challenge is is I think interesting, and I think progress is being made. Um, and uh, I'll just mention some of the progress. Um, there's you you can access this transition via local probe by coupling an ancilla to the local probe. Um, and in this, you know, nice experimental paper on iron traps, there's, there's a bit of uh, active feedback, uh, which is being used to decode uh, and to access the, you know, the, the transition on, on the, the, the volume law phase and the area law phase on small number of ions in an iron trap. Um, there's been work on space-time duels of unitary dynamics, which looks like unitary plus, Q, plus measurements. Um, you could uh, employ a Clifford circuits uh, in a Clifford circuit because it's so simple to simulate classically. You know, if you were making a measurement on your quantum computer and you, you got the wrong measurement outcome, we would know what Pauli string to apply, you know, in order to, to back up and go from psi two back to psi one. Um, one way though, you can try to overcome this post-selection challenge is just by brute force. And, uh, Austin Minich, who's a Caltech professor, I think he's in the mechanical engineering department, you know, had a very recent experiment where they were using these IBM um, superconducting qubit, the digital processors, um, and they used something like 5,200 hardware device hours over, you know, many IBM quantum processes. I mean, it just was, it was amazingly time consuming. And they basically, it was brute force. I mean, they were, you know, taking relatively small number of qubits up to maybe 10, the largest, they were making relatively few measurements up to about 14 measurements. They were running the circuit multiple times to get the same out, you know, outcomes many times. And then they were doing tomography. I mean, they were actually measuring the, the reduced density matrices for different, for different um, size regions. Um, all by, you know, by running the circuits many, 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 many times. And they, they get evidence, you know, for this not, not, not unexpected uh, transition between, you know, what looks to be, you know, a volume law or entangled and, and a, you know, more, less entangled or area law entangled phase. I mean, the, the systems are not big enough to look at the phase transitions or, or otherwise. Um, but I think there's uh, other ways to try to do, uh, uh, decoding to overcome this post-selection by looking at the um, something like it that was done in the the quantum supremacy experiment, where one looks at cross entropy uh, between um, um, the well, when one keeps the in, one keeps the information about the measurement outcomes and uses that information to calculate essentially an entropy cross entropy between that information and um, that in a in, we're simulating in a, in a classical computer. So I think there's going to be interesting ways to to decode the quantum the measurement induced phase transition to to really decode it. Um, so new opportunities in this era, um, and you know quantum antibody theory and quantum information theory. Um, um, you know I'm certainly not the first person to to put these together, but I think now is an exciting time, um, and for someone coming from this camp, it, you know, opening one's eyes to, you know, what measurements can be used for and what's interesting physics that emerges when you start considering measurements as part of your toolkit. Uh, it's, it's kind of eye-opening. Um, and uh, so there's, you know, more generally, one can consider in this quantum interactive dynamics feedback. And so, um, and this is what one would do in active quantum error correction. Um, you know, one would be running uh, the, a quantum computer, making measurements, pulling out classical information, 
uh, using that classical information to infer, for example, the errors that were made, uh, and then you know doing some classical computation and and feedbacking, feed, feeding it back in to 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 correct the errors. Um, but I want to consider you know going not really active quantum error correction per se, but just to view this entire red circle as a, a type of dynamics. You have the quantum computer, you have unitaries being performed on the quantum computer, you have measurements, the classical uh, information is being pulled out, classical results are being processed, there's a feedback. What type of quantum steady states can you get? Can you, for example, get a one-dimensional set of qubits which are in a um, in a, a superfluid phase. I mean, uh, you know, for example, can you get, uh, um, you know, what, what kind of phases can you get? Can you get other interesting phases that we haven't even thought about before? Um, so it, it, I think there's, uh, there's room for exploration, um, you know, which, which I don't know if it's beyond, but it's a you know, slightly different uh, vein than doing active quantum error correction because it, it's, it's, it's a different goal. It's a goal just to try to, you know, construct novel quantodynamical steady states that would need all three ingredients, unitary measurements and, and feedback. Um, okay, so let me just finish, finish up. And um, so I've been talking about this entanglement transition. Um, and, you know, the real focus has been on these monitored systems where, you know, the pure state quantum trajectories are being followed by an, an observer who's making measurements and we've seen that there's a competition between the uh, unitary induced entanglement and the measurement induced disentanglement, which can lead to this entanglement uh, transition. There's a lot of open questions, um, you know, universality class of the transition, disconformal field theory, uh, other dynamical phases and monitored open systems. You know, how much of this can survive when you throw in a little bit of decoherence? Well, not much turns out. I mean, you really need uh, to have it really decoherent free to, to look at some of these things, um, at least at long times. Um, dynamical phase in monitor systems with feedback beyond quantum error correcting, I've already mentioned that. Um, and, you know, further experiments, which hopefully will be forthcoming on, you know, in this, in this, general, in this general area. So anyway, well, thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Matthew, for that beautiful talk. So um, we can open up for questions, either from the audience or the live audience or Zoom audience. Um, I don't know if people can hear me, but if you are on the Zoom, uh, I'm monitoring the chat window, so you can just post questions there. Let's see, John. Yeah, I'm wondering about this issue of robustness to be coherent, and in particular, suppose we post-select on some of the measurements, but not all of them. The reason I ask about that is in the case where we do active air correction, you know, you can think of the environment introducing noise as making measurements and throwing the outcomes away. But then when we collect the, the syndrome for uh, the errors, we have to know what the measurement outcomes are to be able to decode. So in that case, you can tolerate, you know, some noise rate yeah. of measurements for which we don't need the outcomes. So yeah. we're still able in principle to decode. So Seems like you should be able to, you know, have some order one level of decoherence and still have some kind of transition. And now, yeah, the you might have to do active deco active error correction to do that. Yeah, but I mean, it's a question but, of whether in principle you can do that. Yeah, um, I mean, if you in these distant mechanicals mappings, if you just put in depolarizing channels, it looks like a magnetic field on the Ising model, so it kind of destroys. The, transition in, in that sense but um but but then i mean i think what you're talking about is when you're when you're using you're using the results of the some of the measurements right, right to do the, others you throw away. the other ones the environment you throw those away and but then you're doing feedback right and um decoding transition there yeah but a question i um well, I mean, I would say that the transition's there, even if you can't see it, even, I mean, <laughs> well, right? I mean- The question of finding the right kind of word for it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, so I think, I think the, the, 
the issues of decoding and decoding when you have some decoherence, or, or even decoding when you don't have any decoherence is, is still something that, need, that I need to think more about and explore, but uh, um, yeah. Um. There's an issue that appear, uh, you said you were using uh, random triplet circuits in your remote simulation. You said these two, uh, I mean, random triplet circuits sometimes approximate uh, general R and circuits. Yeah. Uh, is there an issue uh, with quality that you look at? Well, I mean, we um, we believe that the nature of the volume of phase is the same for Clifford as for Har. The nature of the transition is is going to be different. Um, now, it, with Clifford, we can work out all the critical exponents and you know very precisely because you can do such big systems. For Har, you maybe do twenty qubits, but you can do enough to get some exponents, uh, and you can see that they're they're going to be different. So Clifford is special. I mean, it's a different ensemble. But it still has enough richness to exhibit the transition, <laughs> and that's that's the uh, nice thing about it is it's you know classical you know simulability, but rich, rich enough to to exhibit the you know the, the the entanglement transition. We have a question from Zoom. It's me. Okay. Uh, hi, Manuel here. Um, you mentioned in one of the slides, maybe you could even go back, that uh, if you actually construct a, a mixed state, the actually density operator, where you don't do the post selection, that all the information about this transition is washed out. Uh, is this obvious that this is true? Um, I, I, let me kind of rephrase my question. So, uh, so is it true? And I'm, I'm wondering about this because of the following reasons. So you're basically saying that it's kind of clear that on the volume law side, there is basically a pure state decomposition of the uh, mixed state, such that if I average the entanglement over the mixed states like that, uh, over the pure states in that pure state decomposition, I get a volume law. Right? So that's some sort of, I guess the way you have, like do this, where you just- uh, Yeah, you're averaging the entanglement entropy computed for each of the pure quantum states. That's yeah. right. So the, basically the statement is there is a pure state uh, decomposition where that average gives you a volume law still. Um, and in a sense, like normal mixed state entanglement measures would say, okay, uh, you would have to take all pure state decompositions and take some sort of take the one with the minimal entanglement basically that you get out. And I, I guess in, if you do it like this, you won't see anything. But I think maybe the statement could be that uh, in the volume law phase, there exists a pure state decomposition at all. Mm, but, uh, well, but you know, I think um, uh, in the area law, it maybe it doesn't exist. But for both the area law and the volume law, the, in, independent of this, for these random circuits, at long times, the mixed de state density matrix goes to the identity. It goes to maximally mixed. I see. I see. So there's, this just has no. This is really just, it's really just completely gone. Basically. It's completely gone. But I mean, for long times, you know, if you ran it for short times, it wouldn't be. So uh, it's clear that basically that information is gone once you do that, basically. Yeah, it is. And so what's kind of a curious is that the, your classical computer keeps the, inform it keeps the wave function psi, you know, each of these wave functions, you can compute anything you want from those. The quantum computer, you can only, you know, make measurements one after the other in terms of these um, wave functions. So it's, it's sort of a classical supremacy, you might say. <laughs> In some sense. But, um... I see, I see. So it's always just mixed basically even for final epsilon eventually, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, this is basically like the errors in a, in a random circuit, they always get into mixed state essentially. Yeah, I see. yeah. Curious, okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Maybe, maybe I missed it, but... Um... In the, in the early volume transition, um, is, this, is there a, in, in the stem like analog? Is there does that correspond to some transition? Yeah, I mean it's. Um, hey, Matt, could you could you repeat the question? Oh yeah, so in the volume law to area law transition, when viewed in terms of the statistical mechanics model, does that involve 
a transition in the domain walls. Um, and I think it does in the same sense that in an Ising model, you know, in, in, a, in the low temperature phase of the Ising model, you know, if you have two phases of the domain wall, and as you raise the temperature towards the transition, that domain wall starts fluctuating around, you get domains that start growing. And, and before you know it, the domain walls proliferate and are just, you know, riddled throughout the system. And so th that, so these domain walls are like entanglement domain walls. And, you know, once you have a lot of these entanglement domain walls, it, 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 it decreases the entanglement. I mean, it, it sort of washes out the entanglement. But, but so you can definitely think about it in terms of a transition in, in terms of the domain walls, at least loosely speaking. But like, uh, is there a value of studying domain wall dynamics in scanning systems as a means to learn? Well, I think you know, there is in the volume law phase where it's just a single domain wall and then this corrected polymer in the random environment, which is you know, where we're studying it dynamically. And that does tell you. I, I should say that this transition, um, there is a limit where it simplifies, which is if you take random unitaries, high random unitaries, um, and you take the local Hilbert space dimension D to be uh, infinite. So rather than Q bits, you take Q dits. Uh, as you take D go to, goes to infinity, the transition approaches that of percolation, uh, where, um, where basically where you make the measurements, you, you, know, you, you cut a bond essentially. And when you make a lot of measurements, you cut a lot of bonds and the whole circuit kind of starts falling apart. That's when you lose the entanglement. Um, and, but if you don't have many, if you're on the other side of the percolation transition, so you've only made a few measurements or a few cut bonds, then, then, then the information can propagate and, it, and, it, and, it's, uh, entang and you can get entanglement. Um, but for finite Q, for finite local Hilbert space dimension for Q dits with D less than infinity, we don't have a, um, a either a numerical or an analytic handle on the transition. And it's uh, from these system mechanics models. I mean, they're replica, replicated models, so they're kind of nasty. Um, okay, well, I think in light of time, maybe we can uh, end here and let's thank Matthew again. For okay. Okay.